good afternoon, good afternoon, uh, dear participants, uh, listeners, uh, dear uh, panelists, uh, and uh, for that matter, actually, I should say good morning to those who join us uh, also on a very esteemed panel from across the ocean uh, on the other side of Atlantic. Uh, it is really an honor and pleasure for me uh, to sort of launch uh, the wrapping up panel, which I think will tackle a, a topic which is sort of like an elephant in a room, or some, some ways invisible elephant in the room, because part of the problem, I guess, is that we can't really see that AI behind. And um, I'm really glad to host today for the debate incredible uh, uh, panelists, uh, uh, esteemed uh, guests of the discussion, uh, which I think we have a very good mix. Uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, experts, uh, namely two, uh, Mr. Darrell West, uh, the Vice President from Brookings Institution, and Mr. David Rain Polgar, uh, two experts from non-governmental sector, from institute and NGOs. And then we have uh, two um, uh, colleagues from the public sector, where I am myself, uh, <coughs> Mr. Amit Mittal, Special Assistant to the President of United States uh, from the White House, and uh, uh, least, but not last, actually the very first, we will kick off the debate because unfortunately due to the schedule, Mr. Cedric O, Minister of uh, State for France for Digital Transition uh, and uh, Electronic Communication. Uh, so welcome all of you to the panel. Uh, I'm really honored to host you all and I will really rely very much on your knowledge because I know a lot of you have written, uh, some of you have written even books on the subject, and I will, I will be gladly uh, sort of uh, taking uh, uh, your knowledge to, to, the, to the debate and see whether we can untangle this rather big and complicated topic. But without further ado, Mr. Minister, I will give a floor to you because unfortunately due to other engagements in your ministerial capacity, you will have to leave us very quickly. So I really want to press you, uh, given uh, that you are from the European side, uh, and uh, you, France has been such a leading way and, and really leading debate and discussion and initiatives in the field of digital and also on AI topics or data topics. So I would really love to hear from you, your perspective. Uh, what do you see as the major challenges, major issues that we need to address? And clearly also pick up some, uh, some good ideas, where do we move forward? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. And, and thank you for having me today. And, and, and sorry, yes, I, I won't be able to stay, but it was important for me to, to take part to, to that debate and to the today's debate, which I think is one of the biggest challenge that, that uh, our uh, countries are, are facing and will be facing in the coming, uh, uh, in the coming years, uh, namely, um, the tension, to put it like this, between uh, a, a growing and, uh, and ever accelerating uh, disruption within technology, uh, between that trend and 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 the societal and, and the the ability of our societies uh, to to afford that or to accept uh, the pace of uh, of development. Uh, I do think that, that we we have three main issues. Uh, which is the first one is innovation. The second one is acceptability. Uh, uh, and, and the third one is with uh, obviously a, a lot of, of uh, connection with the second one, uh, the question of regulation and governance. Um, I, I won't stay too much on the, the innovation question. I, I, I do believe that everybody that is uh, taking part to that panel, but also uh, um, uh, this is, uh, well, we, we all understand uh, the potential, uh, the potentiality uh, that is brought about by emerging technology, especially uh, artificial intelligence, um, uh, within environment transition, uh, the environmental transition within the, the healthcare industry, and and so on and so on. So I, I won't take too much time to to persuade you. Um, I would say that there there is one macroeconomic question uh, that is at stake, um, and and we. we don't have the answer yet. Well, if we see the um, innovation over the past decade, we see that there has been a lot of disruption. But if you look from a macroeconomic point of view, uh, the productivity gains have remained limited, which is at the heart uh, of what we are uh, undergoing these days, those days, which is there is um, an ever accelerating pace of innovation, but 
what the society and what our economies and, and especially the underprivileged are getting from that uh, innovation is not uh, at the same pace. And there is still a question at the end of the day of if there is no uh, productivity gains from a macro and economic point of view, then there will be a huge issue. Uh, because without any productivity gains, we, we don't have any progress or especially social uh, progress. There might be a, a change um, with the generalization of AI. We, we could think, and there is an ongoing debate between econ macroeconomic um, specialists on the fact that AI will entail uh, new productivity gains that will uh, allow our uh, societies, especially in the developed world, um, to, to reconnect uh, with, with consequences uh, and, and, uh, on, the, on the societal side. But this is the main, uh, uh, the main issue. I do believe that uh, the real issue that we have as far as the idea of progress uh, is, is concerned is that among our societies, there has been a disconnection between innovation and progress. Uh, so far, we, we have uh, assumed uh, in our uh, Western world that innovation was entailing progress. And, and what we see, and this is uh, something that is uh, uh, topical in, in France, obviously, with uh, the Yellow Vest movement that we, we saw uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago, but I do think that the tension that we see in the US, in the UK with the Brexit, in South America, in South America all over Europe with the rise of extremes, um, is, is for part a consequence, a consequence on the doubts that our societies, our people have uh, on, uh, on technology, with a huge issue, um, which is that with the acceleration of the pace of innovation, there is a sense of feeling within the general population, um, first, not to understand anything on what's happening. Uh, I, I just have to, uh, to recall uh, the, the figures for France. In France, one people out of six never use is never uses a computer, and one people over out of three uh, has a lack in basic competencies in digital. So, so in in a world that is growingly digital, in a world where everything is getting digital and where data is the is the oil, if you don't understand to begin with how, how you use a computer. But at the end of the day, this is, a, I would say, a question of, of grammar. It's like if you don't understand the grammar uh, of the digital world, then you end up with, uh, with fake news. You end up with a general fear within the society on, on where everything is, is, uh, is getting. And this is entailing and bringing about a lot of democratic, economic, societal, social issues that we are struggling to, um, uh, to, to, to answer to. So, I do think, and, and I just saw the end of the previous, uh, the previous intervention, that as far as that tension is concerned, first, education is key. And, 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 and we still have a lot of progress to make uh, um, within the school system, but also to train and, and to, to help our general population to better understand what is at stake. Otherwise, we will see a growing disconnection, and, and, and I don't think that the future will be bright. There is also an, an, a connected question that is completely linked with that question, is the question of regulation. There is a common sense or a common feeling that um, public power and state especially are losing power or losing, grip, or, or losing grip on what's happening. And that's actually completely true. Uh, uh, especially in democracies where the efficiency of what, of what we are voting and what we are uh, uh, praising for or, or what the decision of the state have huge difficulty to implement within the digital world, um, which is, we have to admit, not completely the case in uh, uh, non-democratic uh, countries. Uh, so, and, and this is a growing tension within democracies because if the only countries that can uh, efficiently regulate the digital area are authoritarian countries, there might be a rising question within democracies on what should be the, real, the, the, good, the, the good solutions. Um, the, the difficulty that we have is, to my mind, twofold. The first one is uh, uh, basic, but it's, it's ability with a, a more and more complex world where uh, algorithms are, are, are running the way our world is functioning. The ability of public power to underst under, understand, uh, decode, and regulate what's happening online 
is completely linked with the fact that we, we don't have the talent within the administration to be able to be at the right level of understanding and answer, first point. Second point is, a, is the tension, and, and this is why the, the discussion between multilateral uh, framework is, is completely important, it's governance. We have um, uh, a, 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 a technical infrastructure that is reticular, uh, that is by essence global, and we have national institutions. I want to mention one question that I've been facing over the past uh, over the past months, which is quite interesting. There has been on, on Facebook uh, uh, a person from India that threatened to death in uh, in its own language, but in a public group, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, using a cultural references that was from a, a Turkish uh, a Turkish uh, TV show. The, the question is, is, is impossible to answer to from a legal point of view today, because French citizens could access to, to that threat, but that was in Hindi. Uh, so which legislation is to be uh, applied to that case? It is the American one because this is an American platform. Is it the Indian one because this is an Indian people? Is it the French one because this is a French uh, uh, presence that has been threatened? This is not about uh, uh, the whole issue of AI, but, but the question is that, Digital is a liquid world. This is a global world, and we have national institution. And, and, and the ability of national institution, the, the capacity of national institution to answer to basic questions asked and, and raised by citizens is at stake. And, and this is why I do think that, that we have a governance issue that we have uh, to be able to solve with cultural differences, with legal differences. But if we are not able to, to answer those issues, I do think that we are threatening the, the, the notion of progress itself, and we will be threatening all the, the progress in healthcare, in, envi 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 environment, in mobility, that could be entailed by uh, um, uh, the, the big data, by artificial intelligence, because the technology itself um, is at stake. Thank you very much. Minister, if I can, I know, I know you're running, but if I can press you very little bit on, on, a, on an aspect, given that I will give a floor now to, to our American colleagues, I, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned quite often democracy, obviously that's something discussed very much that is also at stake. I wanted just to, a few thoughts on you. How do you see transatlantic perspective? How do you see our own sort of democracy house and countries within that part of the world? Do you see prospects? Are we actually getting there among ourselves to, to regulate or figure out how to deal with these complex issues before we sort of address them with our adversaries? I think that, that there is a, a common interest, uh, and, and it, it's interesting how parallel the, the debate are uh, in the US and in Europe. Uh, obviously, we have cultural differences. There is a different balance in the US between free speech and regulation than in Europe, and even within Europe, uh, between uh, uh, Sweden, France, Italy, Spain, and Germany, we don't have the same approach on the balance of, uh, of uh, uh, between regulation and, and, and free speech, for instance. But I do think that there is a, a growing sense of urgency uh, on the fact that we, we cannot let that situation alone. And on a thing that is really important to my mind is the fact that the economic question and the economic business in the business model of digital is linked with what we see in content regulation, in hate speech, in cybersecurity, and so on, and so on. This is why we see that, that we don't have the solution, but the US on their side and Europe on, on its side are revolving around the same question of antitrust, of how do we regulate, uh, how do you, do you design content regulation without uh, giving too much power to, to, to the state because, because that, that's also entailing other, uh, other problems. And, and I, I think that there is a sense of urgency because of what I mentioned. There are other countries, uh, a little bit more in the East, uh, uh, that, that have a, 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 a solution, that are proposing to the world a solution that is coherent. Uh, and we have to be able to find uh, a coherence also within democracies and not let other people think that our differences of approach are greater than our differences with non-democratic answers. Uh, and I think that this is why we, we need to, to be able to overcome, uh, overcome our differences, and we need to be able to, to define a common answer. There will be differences. We don't have 
um, uh, there are always differences, but, but I do think that, that we have to be able to answer. And the regulation of AI is a good example. This is why and, and we had sometimes some tricky discussion with the previous American discussion on multilater multilateralism, to put it mildly. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we, we are well able and we have very uh, efficient talk with the current Amer uh, American administration, for instance, for instance, on the global partnership on AI that we co-created with Canada, uh, because we need a common approach. And, and multilateralism is always slow, is always too slow, uh, but, but this is the only answer that we can uh, build, uh, build upon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, and uh, uh, we'll let you run, do your duties, and all the best, and, and thanks for your contribution. Uh, we, will know, we will now move uh, to Washington, D.C. Amit uh, Mittal, I don't know if you are in Washington exactly, but all eyes on you. I'm sure you are quite used to be having all eyes on you, but given the also uh, the new administration coming in, um, uh, let me sort of... Um, I know that we, due to the fact that the um, French minister had to leave, we kind of already dove into some, some particular aspects, but let me just bring back a little bit uh, the debate to sort of uh, maybe set the stage, a look at the state of play, where we are uh, with... Uh, AI with all these uh, emerging technologies, and occasionally, of course, they are named in different. We speak about big data, we speak about deep learning, we speak of many things, but anything that is this artificial, and, and uh, we can go also in terminology here. But uh, speaking, going back to the state of play, what's your sort of, um, in your new role, and, and, and given your uh, knowledge, What's your feeling? Where, where are we with this understanding of challenges, uh, grasping uh, the situation and, and this innovation that French minister mentioned, like, which moves very fast forward? And um, we remember there were um, sort of a slogan, you know, move fast, break, uh, break things. Um, it's not any more popular. And then somehow, I, my personal feeling is that some of these slogans are somehow now shuffled under the carpet but it has not changed the attitude or the way the business or innovation continues to work. So uh, what's, your, uh, what's your take of current state of play of AI, how far it has moved, uh, is it beyond the control, and what's uh, sort of your assessment? Well, um, thank, you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'm very excited to be here and uh, with this uh, esteemed panel. Um, you know, it's a... It's a, it's a as you know, a quite complicated and multi sort of faceted question and obviously uh, a lot of different dimensions to it. Um, fundamentally, AI is really about um, predicting outcomes based on past learnings from data. Okay, so AI is really about a prediction engine. Uh, I look at what has happened in the past, I build a uh, I being a, you know, from a technology perspective, I build a model which says, hey, this is my model of how the environment works, the world works, usually in a very limited, narrow domain, and then use that to predict, predict an outcome when I see new data. So that's kind of the, the general framework. And so then the question is, within that framework, um, do you... When, when you use this prediction engine, are you respectful of the constraints of both the amount of data that was provided and the kind of data and the diversity of the data that was provided to build this model? Okay, and then do you understand the limitations, fundamentally the limitations, right? Uh, and then the second part is uh, increasingly, you have to say, hey, uh, when I build these models and they're increasingly complex, can I explain the outcomes? Uh, do I know that the, this, this AI is responsible, is ethical, is explainable? These are all you know, in, 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 important factors because very often these predictions uh, and often these predictions lead to decisions uh, affect real people. Okay? And so you have to be able to say, hey, can I actually say that this is done in a fair way? Uh, and these are things that... Um, yeah, I don't believe are yet fully solved. These are things that you know need to be addressed well before we get, you know, uh, before we get we get to a place where we can confidently say that 
automation by AI is something that we can really rely on. Okay. Um, you know, well, the technological, the IT revolution in many ways has been about automation, automating your know, little things, big things, increasingly big things. Uh, but AI is basically a step function. It's a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a quantum jump of saying, hey, this is not just something that I've programmed, written in code. You know, it says, if this happens, then do this, which is very deterministic and it's very explainable. AI is much more about, you know, kind of a probabilistic approach. And therefore, if you cannot fully explain it, then, you know, you need to find a way in which you can do, uh, uh, you can have confidence in the, in the outcomes. Uh, so uh, that's a place that I think it still is uh, a space of a lot, a lot of work, a lot of, <laughs> uh, ironically, innovation. And I think we still have some, some ways to go. Right, thanks. Uh, and uh, I will turn to Mr. Darrell West because he has written a, a, a co-authored co the book uh, called Turning Point, and, and it really is dedicated to the to topic we are dis discussing here, policy making uh, on artificial intelligence. And I would like to sort of grasp your sort of uh, ideas. Um, Amit mentions that this is sort of work in progress. We are getting there. We are working it, and that gives us a better hope, I guess, uh, to step into that process and make it right. Uh, because as you, I actually had not chance to read the whole book, but I did look into some parts and you say that um, you look at the at artificial, uh, artificial intelligence, like I believe very many of us from hard perspective, we kind of, we welcome this uh, innovation, we cherish it, but we are extremely concerned about the harm and that's where sort of governance and uh, regulation questions pop up. And I was wondering, uh, what's your perspective, how far we are in that process where the innovation keeps moving on as, as, as we keep discussing what to do about that and how we can sort of, where do we start to step in actually to catch up? That's a great question. Uh, thank you very much. And you're exactly right. Uh, AI is a work in progress. Uh, we are seeing tremendous opportunities, and uh, General John Allen and I, in our AI book, Turning Point, kind of talk about how AI is being deployed in many different sectors, from education, healthcare, and e-commerce, to uh, transportation and national defense. And if anything, COVID has accelerated the pace of technology innovation. Uh, we suggest that COVID pushed what might have been five years of digital transformation into either five months or five weeks, because we all had to adjust very rapidly to online education, telemedicine, remote work, and e-commerce. So certainly the pace of change is accelerating. Uh, many of the COVID-related changes, we believe, are going to become a permanent part of the landscape. So uh, they are not uh, going away. And as typically is the case with any innovation, the public policy and the regulations lag the technology innovation. I mean, you can go back uh, centuries, and this almost always is the case, that we see technology innovation running ahead. It starts to create problems. People get worried. Policymakers then get attuned to it, and then they start uh, passing uh, laws and new regulations. And we believe we're at a turning point where uh, that is actually now happening uh, with uh, AI, because there is a growing tech lash a backlash against the technology sector. When you look at public opinion surveys, uh, people are worried about the loss of privacy, cybersecurity attacks, uh, antitrust uh, questions. Uh, they want stronger human guardrails on the use of the technology in order to safeguard the innovations. Uh, we know that AI is going to create a lot of advantages. It's going to uh, save people from doing uh, boring, dirty, or dangerous work, and therefore free up humans for more creative activities. But at the same time, uh, there are a number of problems. Uh, we worry about the question of fairness uh, in these emerging technologies. We know that in a lot of respects, technology is accentuating inequality in our society as a whole. And this is a big problem all around the world. Like every country is suffering the ill effects of income inequality. You know, there are protests and demonstrations in many countries around the world. And obviously there are different causes in different places, but inequality is a driving force. And so to the extent that technology contributes to that, uh, there's a problem. 
Uh, people also are worried about a uh, question of bias, both racial bias and uh, gender bias. Uh, in some places, there are geographic uh, biases. In the United States, a lot of our tech sectors on the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, those economies are roaring ahead. Uh, the heartland in between uh, is being left behind. Uh, there's uh, the loss of jobs. There's the danger that many entry level positions are going to be taken. Uh, this is very destabilizing, both in terms of the economics and the politics of uh, those areas. So we going forward, we need to figure out ways to preserve the innovation on the one hand, but promote human values. We need to bend the curve of AI innovation towards ethical considerations. We want the technology to serve our interests, uh, not uh, the interest of other people. And uh, I'm happy to talk about this more uh, later, uh, but in our book, we present a policy blueprint for going forward that we think if we do these things, uh, we're actually quite optimistic about the future, that, our, that we can gain the benefits of uh, technology and start to address some of these pressing issues of privacy, uh, cybersecurity, and competition issues. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good, uh, that's a good segue for me to turn to the, the other panelist. And, and uh, since you ha carry this, uh, one of the buzzwords, tech assists, uh, let me sort of challenge you from, for what uh, was mentioned, you know, these, all the questions of inequality, the biases. You know, we know we are aware of the phenomena, what you feed in, meaning data, that's what you get out, right? And then the question is, uh, what do we do with that that we get out, also based on what goes in, and um, you know, also the fact that the innovation kind of impacts the human, right? It's, it doesn't stay in that virtual world. It comes and it uh, uh, sort of translates into action or impact on a human being. So this, uh, again, buzzword, you know, human-centered technologies. Let me ask you as an the ethicist, you, do you see that possible? Do you see that we can get those technologies be fair, non-biased, and you know, uh, ethically acceptable for human? Uh, yeah, I definitely think it can be more fair. Uh, I think one of the issues, though, is there's a fundamental question before we get into how can we make AI less biased? And the fundamental question is, do we even want to use this AI in a certain situation? So for example, uh, a hot topic is facial recognition. And oftentimes, as alluded to, we talk about uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out, as you're referring to, and that uh, historical data that is biased is going to lead to problematic outcomes. But before we get into making facial recognition better, there's a fundamental question that has to be answered first, which is, does the community want that to be placed in their, uh, in their area? Uh, and one of the issues that I always see that I think is important to mention is that there's oftentimes a gap between the individuals and organizations and companies that are developing and deploying technology, and then the individuals that are impacted by AI. So I think in order to go to a more fair uh, ethical system, a system, what needs to happen is we need to have more individuals who are oftentimes affected by these technologies involved in the political process to determine how they want this technology in their own community. I like to say no application without representation, kind of a, a play on uh, Boston Tea Party, no taxation without representation. I think that's one of the main issues is that you have high level discussions like this where people are very familiar with how AI is, is impacting them, how it affects their career, their trajectory, the jobs they see or don't see, the, how they communicate, even right now with the, the information ecosystem. But oftentimes, at least from my perspective, with being uh, with a broad range of people across civil society, government and industry, one of the base problems that I think we're going to have to deal with in order to have a more ethical tech future is that more, more of the general public needs to be aware of how AI is affecting them. Because I think if we look at right now, we take a snapshot at 2021, the average uh, individual uh, in, in, the, in the public is not always aware of what AI is, is doing to their, their career, their trajectory, what they see or what they don't see. And I think one of, the, uh, one of the problems that we need to deal with is that 
oftentimes artificial intelligence, but even when you mention that term to a broad range of, of people, they think of it in terms of it being very tech, right? Uh, whereas the organization that I'm with, it's called All Tech is Human. And the reason why it's called All Tech is Human is that technology is not doing it, it itself, right? It's not creating itself. It's not creating the laws or, or, or not uh, ha having the laws. So it's up to our human agency to create a lot of the guardrails around this. And I think that's where we're headed over the next couple of years is we need to expand the understanding of AI and its impact on society from a civil liberty standpoint, and then also democracy at large. And we need to incorporate the feedback from those individuals into how we develop and deploy technology. But I think going to the, the issue that I brought up of how we oftentimes fail to understand AI, one of the problems is that with another issue, if you take an issue that's uh, widely discussed like uh, sustainability or environmental concerns or climate change, comparatively speaking, that's easier because I can see an iceberg melt. I can see you know, proof of what is happening. It's visual. Whereas with AI, if we were to make a report on it, like there's plenty of, uh, oftentimes we don't know what images to even use, right? They're, they'll use an image of Sophia the robot or, or Terminator or something from Boston Dynamics. Whereas oftentimes the impact that's, that's really happening to the general public is more subtle, dealing with dark patterns of how it's maybe tilting somebody's human behavior. There's fundamental issues about our freedom of mind and, and our free will. Those are harder issues for the general public to understand if we can't visualize a lot of these problems. So I think to, to fully answer your question, that's where we're going to be headed. We need to incorporate more voices of individuals being impacted. But in order for that to happen, we need to have greater understanding about how we're even being impacted. Thanks. I guess this is, is, this is a little exercise of getting better understanding. And Amit, I will go in a minute to you back to public policy, because I'm, that's a field I'm also very interested in. And I think that is one of those institutions, right, that should be representing the individuals, right, the humans that, that, that it's elected for. But I want to, uh, I want to uh, sort of um, put in the question from the audience, because I think it fits. And there are people who are both addressing transparency, and there is a question, should explainable artificial intelligence be a prerequisite uh, for the widespread of ad adoption of AI? So I see it's like a concrete solution, whether you see this transparency or explainable artificial intelligence as one of those key uh, elements to, to solve this puzzle. I mean, I can jump in on that in the sense that I do believe we need much greater transparency in how algorithms operate. Because part of people's paranoia about AI, uh, David mentioned, you know, the Terminator image, like everybody's worried there's going to be these super intelligent robots that end up enslaving humanity. Part of that paranoia comes from the fact that we don't understand AI. We don't understand how these algorithms operate. We don't know what data are going into it and then how that data is being assessed to then uh, produce uh, predictions and recommendations that then get acted on. So I think at a minimum, governments around the world need to start thinking about ways to improve public understanding of the algorithms, but also promoting the way that the algorithms operate. I mean, a lot of companies say, hey, this is proprietary. You know, we've spent millions or billions of dollars developing this, so we can't let you know what's uh, going on. And certainly I would not advocate, you know, uh, publicizing the code and, you know, putting the millions of lines of uh, code out there uh, for people to inspect. But we do have a, uh, a need to understand how they've developed those algorithms, what values are inculcated in those algorithms, how they operate, how they weight uh, different factors. Like those are all rather generic things that do not endanger the commercial interests of the algorithm uh, directors, but would still then inform the public about how those algorithms are operating and how they're making decisions. Because I think if people had a better understanding of how they were making decisions, they would be less paranoid about them. So yeah, let me, uh, let me add to that. Um, I think one of the big challenges is that the people creating the algorithms and building the models, they themselves really 
don't have a full understanding of how the model works. Um, and it's probably unreasonable to expect, you know, the average citizen to be able to, you know, even if you were to expose all the code, all the data, all the models and all that stuff, uh, especially with the more advanced uh, AI techniques, uh, you know, that use unsupervised learning, et cetera, uh, it's unreasonable for to, you know, to expect the average citizen to say, I really understand what's going on, when even the developers cannot really explain, hey, why does a model behave a certain way? So I think there, in fact, is an urgent need for a couple of things. One is a framework, which I don't believe really fully exists yet, a comprehensive framework, which says, um, here are the expectations of how this, say, AI that is you know, having this impact on your life. So number one, say, what is the impact or what is the domain of impact? Okay. Um, what are the characteristics of that impact? Okay, so there's a whole sort of framework to explain that, a whole vocabulary to explain that. Okay, um, it's you know one of the things I mentioned earlier is that one of the challenges with um, with AI is that unlike in the past where you said, hey, I have a rules-based approach or a rules-based algorithm where you can deterministically say if this happens, then that happens. You know, this is where our this is the way our regulations are written. This is the way our laws are written. Uh, many of the newer AI approaches are inherently probabilistic, so you don't really have if this then that. Okay, so then what is the framework by which you explain what the outcomes are likely to be? And then secondly, uh, are there any guardrails that you can establish to say, okay, this is not what is going to happen. You know, this thing is out of bounds, right? And so that whole framework, so if, if, you, if the intent is to say people and citizens understand what the impact of AI is going to be, then I don't think we yet have the right frameworks and vocabulary and also guardrails where, by which you can, and in fact, communicate that effectively. I mean, certainly you can throw a whole bunch of uh, jargon, but if you want effective, scalable communication, I think that, that that framework still needs to be developed, or at the very least improved. And, and what I could add to that is, yeah. is I think it, it might not have to be that the average citizen understands how it's working because oftentimes as I go about my life, as you go about your life, we don't understand how, let's say, the food process works, but we create a food and drug administration that I understand when I'm eating my salad that most likely it's, it's, it's safe. So the same thing I think is, is going to crop up over the years where you're going to see more risk assessments around AI that gives um, ability to trust a lot of the systems. And that's why I think trust is becoming such a key word. But the other key word that I, that I want to throw in there also is accountability. And I think one of the dangers that, uh, that we have over the, over the next couple of years is if we allow technologists to almost delegate their responsibility to say, well, we can't fully understand how a system is working. The reason why it's so problematic is because to delegate to AI is also to a large extent delegating responsibility. And at the end of the day, when there's a problem, when a autonomous vehicle maybe gets in an accident, and we've seen a few with, with Tesla come up recently that, that bring up thorny issues, somebody has to be uh, at fault at the end of the day uh, with, with any type of system. Uh, the same thing where you see a lot of uh, you know, algorithms used in, in hiring decisions uh, to understand if there's any type of discrimination in the hiring process. We, we know this from you know, gender and race and how we would uh, kind of interrogate a system when it's in person. But now we also need to have that same level of accountability and in, in, uh, the ability to interrogate in a kind of more algorithmic leaning system. Because without that, then we are really backtracking on a lot of the progress we've made in the civil rights arena over the last uh, 50 some odd years. Leads me to uh, the topics that I wanted to push Amit <laughs> towards, and I think there is a quite a. I mean, if we follow the debate, we kind of everybody seems to agree there is a need for laws and regulations and accountability, and probably is a framework that sort of 
puts up this fra uh, the, uh, the regulation uh, sort of uh, transparency requirements and all the others. So um, my question will be more sort of uh, towards concrete direction with the new administration. Uh, do you, I mean, see that coming to some results? Do you see some of these elements actually ripening in some whether laws or initiatives? I did look uh, through the, the impressive report that was done by National Security Commission on AI, only about uh, almost 800 pages. Uh, I have to admit that very little was dedicated to humans. A lot of that spoke about innovation, and I think that leads again back to the, the, the aspect that French minister mentioned, right? It's about innovation and human value. And we have this struggle, you know, we don't want to sort of uh, kill the innovation, but we want to protect human value. And certainly in that report, that, there was a very huge emphasis that, you know, America might uh, lose the upper hand in, in a global sort of technology competition, uh, yet, we speak a lot about those regulations and need, uh, need to get it right. So, from your perspective, I know you are recently in office, but how do you see these concrete steps that would go, that would gear us to these human-centered solutions? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And, you know, you're right. I mean, there is uh, there's, there's two aspects, and there's a... Uh, we kind of simultaneously to have, have to have these two different ideas and two different sort of almost competing ideas simultaneously in our, in our, in our minds. And one is, this, you know, the, the, uh, the promise and the excitement around AI is that, you know, in, in some sense you can, uh, to the extent you can capture judgment and you can learn uh, about, about the world in a very scalable and very low, efficient, and low latency way, and then apply that at massive scale you know, with, with uh, almost instantaneous results, that is very, very sort of enticing. And, you know, it's easy to imagine how such a system could make things a lot more efficient, access to information. You know, uh, people talked about autonomous driving, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, you know, we also have to, um, as, the, as the French minister say, said, um, map that to, 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 to the human impact. And that is frankly work in progress, right? Uh, you know, going back to the uh, autonomous driving example, it may be uh, that autonomous driving, and you know, it's, uh, at least my opinion is, is that it's likely that autonomous driving will result in fewer accidents and fatalities, okay? Uh, but so let's take that hypothesis to be true. But let's also say that uh, it doesn't go to zero, okay? That there are some cases where people get to accidents. Well, you know, when, when, a, when, a, human get, when a human is driving a car and gets in an accident, the framework is pretty well understood. The legal framework, the insurance framework, the societal framework, you know, the human, everybody understands, you know, what happens, how do you establish fault, you know, how do you get compensated? All those things are relatively well understood. We've had a hundred, hundred plus years to, to figure that out. Okay, but when a autonomous vehicle gets into an accident, and, and especially if that accident is as a result of a basically a no a no win choice, you got to choose between one harm or the other harm. Okay, um, then who has you know sort of quote unquote fault, and how do you resolve that? And all these things, are, you know, these are all things that. You know, as the so AI for a long time was you know kind of off on the side, and you could say, hey, there are some very benign applications of AI. And I might get into trouble for saying this, but you know, one one for example, one benign application is a massive advance advance in speech recognition, where you say, hey, you know, and I can talk to my computer, okay, and can do all kinds of things for me. It can help me, you know, navigate. It can help me, you know. Uh, transcribe my email, it can help me order stuff, it can you know, help, help me maintain my shopping list, all those things. So that's what to be benign. But as you know, the, uh, the applications of AI start really colliding with the physical world and the human world in a more direct way, I think you know, that, that framework is, 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 is still to be developed. And you know, that is you know, definitely something that we have to you know, uh, spend time thinking about and being very careful about you know, coming up with the right way 
in which people can reason about AI in a way that you know, also maps to our historical experiences. You know, one of the challenges is that this whole domain is so new that many of our existing models of how the world works don't necessarily map to you know, how AI might necessarily operate. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I ask, uh, maybe uh, Mr. West also reflect a little bit, you know, you wrote a policy making and you, I'm sure you looked also at this, uh, this huge report on AI. And I'm sure uh, also you are aware that the European Commission has produced some documents uh, slightly shorter, <laughs> but also reaching over 100 pages. And then they have taken this approach to sort of separate the risks, right? To judge and, uh, and um, apply regulation on AI from the risk perspective. You, you have unacceptable risk, which is also interesting because that basically precludes to use that. And there's a specific social crediting even mentioned out that that would not be acceptable, right? Uh, then uh, there is this high risk. I wonder whether this uh, uh, the, the, um, a case that, you, that Amit mentioned on, on transportation and cars, I imagine that probably would fall into high risk category. So where do you see, uh, the, is, are we getting to that framework? Uh, is these, uh, are these sort of developments that you see on both uh, coasts of Atlantic uh, leading us to some solutions uh, coming uh, sort of in place? Well, in the past, I have to say there has been a gap between the EU and the United States in terms of tech related policies and regulations in the general direction of the EU has been much tougher on the tech sector than has been true in the United States. But I believe going forward, that gap is going to narrow. Uh, the Biden administration has already appointed several tough-minded individuals to crucial regulatory agencies, uh, kind of signaling that there's going to be tougher antitrust enforcement, uh, greater protections in terms of personal privacy, uh, tougher action on protecting cybersecurity, uh, and things of that sort. And then you mentioned the new uh, EU guidance that has an interesting approach to AI uh, which you uh, describe as a risk-adjusted approach to regulation. And I personally think that is actually a very good way to uh, think about it. And in our Turning Point book, we actually talk a lot about this, that you know, it's easy to kind of put AI into one category and then it becomes difficult to figure out, well, how do we regulate it? Because we have AI in finance and transportation and education and healthcare, they're all a little bit different. And so it's kind of hard to figure out what the proper regulatory approach. I think what the European Union did was actually a very creative solution to that problem in the sense that it gears the scope of the regulation to the scope of the risk, which from my standpoint is exactly the way we need to think about it. Because there are some AI applications where the human risk is fairly minimal. And in those areas, I think it makes sense both for the European Union as well as the United States to have pretty much a hands-off approach to it you know, kind of trust the uh, innovators, uh, let them uh, deploy their products. But as you point out, uh, there are other AI applications uh, that represent major threats to human safety. Certainly autonomous vehicles, I would put in that uh, category. Uh, there are some employment applications uh, where AI is being used to screen job applications. That has a big impact on the applicant uh, pool. Uh, David mentioned the facial recognition issue, particularly when it's used by law enforcement with the inaccuracy disparities between whites and minorities, that's a very dangerous application. So we need to kind of start thinking about the possible risk of discrete AI applications. And for high risk things, they clearly warrant greater oversight, uh, more regulation, more human guardrails uh, put in place. But there are lower level applications that don't pose nearly the same level of risk and there, I think a more libertarian stance makes sense. So I think the two uh, uh, places are actually starting to come together. And I think some of the new changes that I'm envisioning that the Biden administration uh, are going to undertake, it's going to be tougher on the tech sector. And it's therefore going to reduce what was a more substantial gap between uh, Europe and the United States and kind of put them uh, in a closer direction, which I think will be important from a geopolitical standpoint, 
uh, because if the US and the EU are in alignment in how they're thinking about the future of technology, that will create a sharp contrast between how we're thinking about it and how we want technology to conform to democratic values versus how other people around the world, i.e. Russia and China, are envisioning the future of technology. Uh, great. David, would you like to add, do you see that these uh, sort of steps from European side, uh, I'm not sure about American, I think American actually, right, you're right, the positioning of a new a new people on the administration actually does signal already in itself. Do you see these promising uh, addresses of the ethical sort of aspects that those, those are coming sort of all together through these documents? I do, yeah. I actually do see a lot of uh, promising signs. I think as, as Daryl was alluding to a few years ago, there used to be a, a wider gap between uh, how the US was thinking about regulating or oftentimes not regulating technology, specifically around social media and uh, the European framework. But I think in recent years, especially with the advent of GDPR, which then kind of prompted California as a state to create something very similar. And then a couple of years before that, with the right to be forgotten, also affecting some of the conversation in the United States, the gap really is limiting because I think oftentimes it's a balance of trust because the average individual, the average citizen, uh, is basically saying, well, who do I trust more or who do I trust less? And I think the kind of experiment of giving too much leeway to Silicon Valley is probably coming to, uh, to an end. Uh, as as Errol also re uh, referred to, you, you have people like Tim Wu, uh, a well-known uh, professor from Columbia who promoted the idea of net neutrality, also now in the, the Biden administration that are going to take a tougher type of type of stance. So uh, there is a lot of hope for it. And I think it needs to be framed differently though, in that oftentimes, at least from my perspective as, as an American, one of the traps that oftentimes happens is people get into a debate about how fast innovation goes. And then it always leads to the end argument of saying, well, you can't slow down innovation. But oftentimes what the general public wants is not slowing down innovation, but they wanna speed up consideration about how the development and deployment of technology is going to impact them. Uh, an example I, I could give is in uh, New York City where, where I'm based, there was a incident a few weeks ago that led to a lot of uh, media discussion and it was dealing with a uh, Boston Dynamics, which creates a lot of these high-end robotics that, that have viral videos. Uh, the NYPD, the police department in New York City, uh, they were utilizing one of the kind of digi dogs or this robot dog, uh, if you will. And that really created a stir from the general public who felt uneasy about it. And I think an area that I would like to kind of, kind of mention is that I think we need to expand the discussion outside of solely a risk assessment. Because if you look at the Boston Dynamics dog, and how they were using it, they were, you know, they could send it into situations to maybe de-escalate uh, or if there was a hostage situation. This is, if you were doing kind of a pros and cons list, uh, you would say, well, this can save the life of a law enforcement agent. This can actually be uh, a, a win for humanity at large, but there's deeper issues. Even if the dog per se is not a danger to the general public, and I mean, obviously the, the, the camera, that's probably the, the part that makes people feel uncomfortable. There's something a little more emotional and psychological about it. So I think uh, an area that I like to advocate for is this is where a conversation around AI needs not only technologists, but also psychologists and sociologists and game theorists and, and, and you know, uh, attorneys and really everybody. It's a multidisciplinary effort because the impact of technology and how people feel about it is not always based on kind of a logical risk assessment about how something will affect them. It's something a little deeper about their free will and, and freedom of mind and just uh, right to privacy. And that's a little harder to capture. And that's why I think over coming years, in order to improve on a lot of these systems, there's going to be greater integration of a lot of these impacted communities inside of the political process before a lot of the technology is 
being kind of uh, deployed. And, and again, if you look at the, uh, the, the tension, it usually tends to be between the gap between how fast something is moving and, and how slow we are considering it and individuals feeling uh, that they don't have power. So I really would frame a lot of these issues around uh, power, a power imbalance. And over coming years, you're going to see citizens kind of demand more power in this, in this structure in order to have kind of say over, uh, over the uh, private kind of, kind of businesses. And another issue that recently came up, which I think can be applied to this uh, discussion, is a lot of people are discussing the recent uh, decision by the Facebook Oversight Board. Uh, what that really brings to mind, though, is how do you balance the role of government versus the role of a business versus the role of a quasi-governmental type of body that is appointed by a, uh, by a business? And I think that's going to be the struggle that we're going to have over the next couple of years is do we position these inside of governments? Do we create some type of independent body or do we allow the self-regulation to, to happen within companies? Actually, that's an excellent segue because we have also questions from audience and apparently a number of them come in about exactly this structure. And I really don't want to go slippery slope into social media because that's a dangerous territory <laughs> and super hot topic uh, <laughs> that uh, colleagues here have spent already substantial time. Nevertheless, the question of oversight, right? You mentioned that in Facebook, and that's very relevant. So, Amit, what's your feeling? Do we have uh, the right tool structures? Do we have to create a new institutions? Uh, do you have uh, sort of tools that you're in your hands that need just to be improved? And I think more not only in a national perspective, but probably, I would say, about around democracy, you know, gathering democratic countries and figuring out what are these tools uh, how we ensure this oversight uh, those, of those values that we want to preserve uh, with our, do we have those tools or do we have to create new structures, new organizations? Uh, what's, what's your take? And also, if any other colleagues, please. Yeah, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, and as, uh, as both uh, David and, and Daryl have already mentioned, you know, this is an example of... Um, Technology uh, getting far, technology and its capabilities getting far ahead of uh, any sort of regulatory framework or, or, or uh, legislation, um, you know, to um, um, to contain it. And you know, in, in this case, it's probably even more than that, which is, um, you know, what we've seen in the last the twenty or thirty years not just, and this is beyond AI, this is uh, the communications revolution. Um, you know, one of the things that has, that has happened, especially with internet-based communication, is uh, the traditional models that, you know, that humans have been constrained by for disseminating information, uh, the, the traditional, certainly the, the, uh, the constraints have mostly disappeared. And you can communicate any information to anybody on any, on any part of the planet at massive scale instantly. You know, and that certainly wasn't true you know, as recently as 50 years ago, 100 years ago, right? There were technological limitations, there were all kinds of limitations there. And, you know, frankly, we don't have a framework as a society for thinking about what, what, what that actually means and what the appropriate way of um, and whether it's even appropriate to constrain it, right? I mean, because obviously that you know it, it bounces right against uh, free uh, free speech principles, uh, you know, which as you know are you know are very very important certainly in um, in America. Um, and then what the role of government should be, and you know these are all very very important questions. Uh, there's certainly consequences to you know uh, to these capabilities that that exist today, and you know we've uh, so so this is this is an active debate that we need to uh, that you know that is an active debate that we are working on, and that's something that you know but it's not easy because these frameworks and these uh, um, these models for how to think about this um, are still evolving sort of in real time, and you're still learning how society is reacting to this. 
I mean, the whole phenomenon of, say, social media isn't really that old. You know, 15 years ago, you know, there were maybe a few thousand people, you know, uh, on social media. And it's, it's, it's easy to forget that, that that was only 15 years ago. And now there's billions of people. And so, you know, we, as, as a society, we simply haven't evolved fast enough to think about what is a reasonable and more importantly, durable framework. You, know, you can come up with stuff and you know, there's a lot of reactionary things that say, hey, we should do this or do that. But what you really need is something that's durable that will survive, you know, and that will evolve over time, but also the framework will survive, you know, uh, through the years. Because the, probably the worst thing you can do is come up with something and then have to change it the next year and the next year. So it requires, you know, very, very, a very thoughtful response. And that's something that I know many governments are actively working on. So I can add a little bit to what Ahmed had to say. I think he makes a number of uh, good points there. I think when you look at our current tools, they tend to be sector by sector and company by company. So for example, in the United States right now, our national government, uh, the Department of Justice has a lawsuit against Google on competition uh, issues. And our Federal Trade Commission has a lawsuit against uh, Facebook. And so it's an example of how when we're currently thinking about regulation, we kind of do it case by case and company by company. And that is a useful way to do it in the sense that, you know, you can find the evidence and then you can impose fines or other, you know, civil uh, uh, penalties uh, based on uh, the scope of the infraction. But I think there is a question as to whether we need something bigger and more system wide. So uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Tom Wheeler at Brookings, has proposed the need for what he calls a digital regulatory agency that instead of looking sector by sector and company by company, would kind of think more broadly about uh, some of these challenges and how we can think about them. Uh, countries also just need to think about whether they need new laws. I mean, uh, Europe has the uh, general data protection uh, uh, regulations, uh, which I think is definitely a step in the right uh, direction. The US Congress needs a national privacy law that starts to move our country closer to that kind of model in terms of protecting consumer privacy and overseeing data sharing practices to make sure that they are fair and equitable. Now, the state of California already has passed a privacy law that kind of moves it closer to the EU model. But you know, I think that's an example where the US national government needs a national privacy law. And by the way, our technology companies want that. Uh, most of them have actually come out in favor of more regulation. They support a national privacy law. So I do think uh, there are some new tools that we need, and some of them may be new regulations. Some of them may just be new policies. Yeah, if I could add, add to that as well. Uh, there's a lot of interesting issues when, when you're dealing with social media because uh, and, and also sit on TikTok's Content Advisory Council, and we also put a report on improving social media uh, that, that talked to a pretty wide range of individuals from a lot of these tech companies. And one of the problems that I'm seeing that I think is going to be a real struggle over the next couple of years is the general public oftentimes relates to major social media companies like Facebook as if Facebook is a governmental body. And this is where the, the problems lie, uh, even when we talk about uh, issues like uh, Amit brought up of free speech, which is uh, you know highly uh, sought after and protected uh, in the United States. One of the, the problems that occurs is that we oftentimes refer to Facebook or Twitter as affecting the citizens' free speech, when the way that the US Constitution is written, it's worried about the role of government in uh, curtailing speech. And actually under US law, it'd be the private business that actually has the free speech right that it's exercising. That's not necessarily something that the general public probably agrees with in terms of how it, how it actually works, but that's where it currently stands in 2021. So where I see a lot of this issue headed is that, especially after the debate with the Facebook Oversight Board, the general public is relating to these oversight boards and especially uh, the role of Facebook as a governmental type body. But there, there's a huge issue with that. And that means that right now, as it's currently written, uh, that means there's a tremendous amount of power with 
a, a leader like Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, but unlike a democracy where if you don't like an elected official, they get voted out, out of office uh, because of the, the shares and, and the structure, uh, you can't get voted out of office. That presents a real issue in terms of how we relate to uh, social media in a democratic norm. Uh, so where I see a lot of this going is that we're going to have to, we don't know what this looks like right now because it's, it's something new, but we're going to probably eventually have some level of uh, elected body, you know, inside of, of tech companies. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of people are talking about what content is or is not appropriate, which obviously varies depending on cultural norms across the world. Whereas you have primarily US companies that are then deciding, do they adjust to the cultural norms across the world? Or do they create this kind of American centric type of understanding? But we've seen that uh, challenge because under, under US law, you can uh, deny the Holocaust, uh, but uh, Facebook recently kind of changed the rules to eliminate Holocaust denialism. Right, so you do see a little bit of a more global fashion that seems to be occurring in social media companies. Uh, and I think even a few years prior with the uh, Christchurch uh, incident, you saw major social media companies uh, you know, go to Paris right after that to, to convene uh, you know, a, a debate, a conference understanding. So I, I do see a, a little bit of hope with more collaboration but I think the issues that, that are really going to have to get ironed out is how do we create more accountability and kind of position social media companies in a in-between role? And I think that's why a lot of, uh, a lot of scholars mention, uh, you know, is social media a utility? Is it a media company? What is it, right? It's not framed as a, a telephone company the way we kind of originally thought about it under uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, which, which some people are debating in the United States. So we need to, over the coming years, really define how we see social media, if we see it in this kind of in-between fashion, and then how we incorporate public oversight inside of some of these companies. Because at least from my perspective, we are definitely not relating to, to Facebook and social media companies as if they are a private company. We're relating to them as if they have the power of government, and that's why we've seen governments even relate to these companies as a kind of country. Uh, a few years ago, you saw Denmark create their tech ambassador. Uh, you know, if, if you look at the power of of Facebook or other social media companies, they they do wield the uh, the amount of uh, users and money of of many many countries throughout the world. So uh, a lot a lot needs to change, but uh, but I think that's where we're likely headed. Thank you. Uh... Thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, I agree from my perspective, also working in public sector as at institutions is also a challenging question, and it's also linked to the trust, because I think we need the institutions or tools that we create uh, that have to be in a way that people trust, right? They delegate and they trust that the judgment of that institution is worthwhile to sort of delegate, if those are in case of AI, some of the decision-making functions. And then I think the trust is actually has eroded both on the government side, right, and, and also on the tech companies' side. So it's very difficult to create those trust, trustworthy institutions. Um, we are getting also questions uh, from the audience, no surprise, that we will be, and this is a hint, we will be steering into this very narrow topic, <laughs> into broader one, looking at the international adversaries and how does it all look. But before that, I actually, for a fairness of the topic, and the topic is like living smart, right, and thinking of good sides, and we have spent a substantial amount on threats, and I'm probably that is a top issue that we all have to deal, but also French minister mentions that I, that kind of stuck in my mind is this fact, are there gains for people? The question of productivity. Uh, what's your take right now of all the AI things that are coming up, the innovations that we're seeing or is about to appear? Do we really have a confidence that that, is a, that uh, brings uh, either gain for people or, or even productivi productivity in an economic terms that Minister mentioned? What's, what's your perspective from, from your... Speaking of good sides. So, yeah, let, let, let me jump in on this. Um, so, you know, my, my background is as a, as a technologist. And uh, 
you know, my entire career have had a fundamental belief on the power of technology to uh, improve people's lives and improve their experiences. And, you know, we've seen, certainly seen that in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in healthcare, in communications, in, in so many things, in, you know, access to power and energy and uh, food supply, all those things. Uh, just even more recently, um, you know, in, 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 in many ways, the, uh, you know, as, as, as terrible as this pandemic has been, the rapidity by which vaccines were created is frankly a technological marvel. It's, it's, it's you know, it's just somewhat miraculous. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a, um, there's, there's kind of these, there's this uh, triangle of three things that we kind of have to balance. There's innovation on one side of the top of the triangle and the benefits you get from the innovation and in ex new experiences and efficiency and convenience. Okay. Um, and then on the other points of the triangle, there's, you know, this trustworthiness, you know, which uh, Daryl and, and, and David have brought up, which is uh, fundamentally, do you, do, you, do you trust this innovation and do you trust that it is acting on your behalf in the, in the best, you know, in, 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 and in the best way? And this, the third part is accountability. If something happens, okay, and things inevitably do, then who is accountable, right? And it's a balance between these three things. Uh, which will, you know, which lead people to either decide, hey, this is the innovation that I want to embrace because I believe there's accountability and I believe it's trustworthy or not. Okay? I think the French minister made a really good point around, um, around productivity gains. Uh, you know, uh, the IT gains have improved productivity, but, you know, they are, uh, they, uh, you could also argue that, that those gains have, um, have slowed down and they aren't, you know, nearly as extreme as you know as we might have imagined 20 years ago. Okay? But if you think, for example, at the gains in consumer experience, um, and the, you know, just in the last 10 years, if you think about the, you know, the what is you know called the appification of so many things, and when you pull out your smartphone, and you've got these 200 apps, um, where you know. Um, so later today, for example, I'm going to be taking a flight. And if I think back 15 years ago, what that process looked like versus what happens today where you just say, okay, I've checked in, right? I picked my seat and then I show up at the gate. I, my boarding pass is on my phone. I mean, you know, and that's true for flying. That's true for ordering food. That's true for, you know, uh, calling a taxi or the equivalent of calling a taxi, uh, checking my bank account, you know, like every, every, so many parts of our, our lives have become so amazing and, and, and so many communication, the, the ease by which we can remain connected with our loved ones on any part of the planet. It's quite remarkable. Um, so, 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 and, and you know, and, and, and I think in some ways that's reflected by the choices people have made. The fact that there's been such a widespread adoption of these experiences and these technologies, at least what that tells me is that when you think back at that triangle, people have said, yes, the convenience and the experience I get is appropriately balanced by the trustworthiness and the accountability. Okay? But now coming full circle, as the way these experiences are delivered to us are increasingly powered by things like AI, okay, that framework now needs to evolve because now our my ability, for example, to predict an outcome of what happens within an app I love, okay, suddenly starts changing, okay, and it starts behaving in ways that don't make sense to me, okay, then my trustworthiness in it and my questions of accountability also change. Um, so, you know, this, this is a, you know, from a technology perspective, it's, a, it's an incredibly exciting time, but from a you know, policy perspective and how society reacts to this, it is, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot to be discovered and, uh, and developed and, you know, it can also be somewhat confusing. So I agree with uh, Ahmed on many of those points. I mean, I think it is an exciting time in technology innovation and there are lots of uh, great opportunities that are developing. I mean, it's easy to see some of the obvious problems and 
you know, become uh, doomsayers and, uh, you know, just think that uh, technology is going to ruin humanity. Uh, and that's not my view because we actually already have seen a number of examples where uh, technology is improving human existence, relieving human, humans of dangerous jobs. There's some sectors where there are productivity enhancements that are taking place. Uh, I would look at the area of manufacturing, like Increasingly, manufacturing is becoming advanced manufacturing. Uh, we are seeing some places where there are fully automated factories uh, that are producing uh, goods uh, that are perfectly uh, safe. Uh, so I think we will see uh, more of that. Uh, even in areas uh, like agricultural, there are interesting developments uh, that we refer to as precision agriculture kind of the use of new technologies that allow farmers to become more productive and more effective about planting their crops and uh, managing their acreage. Uh, and so I think uh, those certainly are uh, very uh, useful. And as Ahmed pointed out, like in healthcare, like we develop these new vaccines in record time. I mean, we should feel great uh, about that. And, and technology certainly was a part of that uh, story. In the education area, although online education has been a mixed bag during the pandemic, and you know there are many eight-year-olds who hate being in front of a computer screen for five, six, or seven hours a day, we also have to keep in mind technology in the education area allows people in poor communities in remote rural areas uh, to basically access knowledge that is available to the very richest areas in uh, the richest uh, countries. Uh, you know, just the development of electronic resources and online resources uh, allows the poor person in Idaho and in the middle of Africa to access online resources that are available to uh, people in the wealthiest uh, countries. So even though there are problems of online education that we need to do a much better job on, in general, uh, uh, technology is going to help level the playing field and bring educational opportunities to a much broader range of people. And if I could add on to that, I think that's why uh, we want to make sure that the future is evenly distributed, uh, especially right now, living through this uh, trying pandemic. Uh, one of the areas that's really come up has been the digital divide, especially since so much of even, even uh, registering for a vaccine or tracking uh, is, is based on having, uh, having this access. So uh, I'd like to kind of tie that in with uh, what Daryl mentioned earlier with the tech lash. But I think if you really analyze this tech lash, it's less about citizens being upset with the technology per se, and more about them being upset with their lack of control about how the technology affects their trajectory or destiny in life. And if you really examine a lot of the uh, issues that happen, it's, it's less similar to kind of the Luddites that people like to mention about the, uh, the, the, the loom. Uh, it's more about feeling that an algorithm is affecting their life of how they get a job or what they see or whether they get promoted. And they have little ability to understand the system and little to no ability to affect how that system is, is implemented. So I think that's the, the larger issue is that everything dealing with uh, the, the current kind of tech lash is really about citizens wanting more kind of uh, embedding inside of the fabric of tech development and deployment and less about saying, oh, I, you know, I don't want this, this technology as we've seen with everything with, with COVID, especially even today, this discussion, we've really leaned into a lot of our, our digital tools to uh, alter our environment in ways that post COVID are probably going to be advantageous uh, especially to our kind of work-life balance. You know, people are disrupting a lot and, and really rethinking uh, how they go about their lives and, and how they, you know, think about, you know, uh, vacation time and, and loved ones. Uh, so I think that's, that's important to know too, is that people want to embrace and lean into a lot of the, uh, a lot of the value of AI, but that's contingent or dependent on 
making sure that they don't feel like there's a Wizard of Oz, that there's a person behind the curtain that's affecting them that they have little understanding of. So AI really needs to be demystified and brought into the political process. So then people feel this trust. But what I would tack on with that too, is it's not solely about trust, but also making sure that the trust is not uh, given to a company that has absolute power, that there still needs to be uh, public accountability and kind of a diffusion of, of power within any, any system as well. Thank you. Let I me, can let see. Me just add one. Yeah. Sorry, if you don't, let me add just one more point, which is, uh, and you know, I think it's important that we don't forget this, which is um, widespread access to information, widespread convenient access to information is one of the most powerful tools we have to you know, promoting democratic uh, principles and you know, kind of the kind of ideas we've been talking about you know, in this conference. And you know, technology certainly has a very large place to play in disseminating that information. Now, of course, you've got to balance that against if you have some other technology that's mediating what you get to see and deciding what you get to see and controlling what you get to see, then that is something that, you know, as you know, other panelists have, have talked about, needs to be well understood, well communicated. Um, and, you know, going back to the framework we talked about, you know, just uh, thought about in a way that is scalable and durable. Thanks. Uh... Uh, information space is, is, is a challenge, so, so are other threats. And then I can even feel that though we try to sort of speak of good sides, it does always lean back also in the concerns. And it also reminds me that it's, it is hard also to judge this, uh, the, the benefit um, of uh, innovation or AI in future, because it's like people, you know, welfare is judged from how much, how big is your salary, and it's not like, Convenience not necessarily translates into monetizing in a one's individual uh, sort of perception of, of technologies. Yet, I agree, it has created an amazing convenience for us, be it you know, travel, health, and all kind of other sectors. So with this, let me, let me sort of uh, widen a little bit, broader the topic, which is already quite big. Let's, let's level it up to the global scale. And I'm sure, Amit, you are security concerned person too. And I'm sure besides the, all the concerns we actually have internally as a democratic country is, you know, worried about individual and human and humanity with, with uh, those disrupting technologies that come out. Uh, what sort of, what keeps you up at night, as they used to say, from the security perspective and technologies, uh, knowing that there are different countries around the globe uh, with a, with a powerful capacity. Uh, again, referring to French minister, he mentioned the fact that regulations are written somewhere else, currently that dominate, start to dominate the world. So, and the, the audience also sort of uh, alludes us to the fact whether uh, sort of, uh, we have to become prepared by China uh, written uh, uh, authoritarian uh, AI that will impact all of our lives. Uh, Amit, I don't know what's uh, what would be your, uh, what, what, what are your key concerns thinking about AI and national security, which you are obviously focused on? Um, yeah, so this is a very, very long conversation, um, but I'll try to be uh, as, 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 as brief as possible on this. Um, so, you know, one of my big focus areas is, is cybersecurity. And because, I mean, and the fundamental uh, way you know, I, I, I think about it is, um, you know, our, so much of our world has become digitized. And especially in America, you know, so many of the systems and experiences that we rely on, you know, critical infrastructure, all critical infrastructure, all the way to Uber and everything in between is, is all digitized, right? And uh, a lot of this stuff depends on, on the internet which historically wasn't really designed with strong sort of security principles in mind. And so, you know, uh, and we see this now on, almost on a daily basis, 
where um, citizens, businesses, governments face a lot of cybersecurity threats. And these threats are only, and if you, know, if you go back to thinking, how do these threats happen? You know, often these threats are highly skilled programmers, hackers, trying to find vulnerabilities in our systems and exploiting them. And so to the extent AI is also a way of learning about you know, judgment, and if it can be used to accelerate and amplify these threats, then, then that is something that you know, uh, I spend quite a bit of time worrying about. And you know, that is something that we have to anticipate and, and strengthen our defenses for. Um, because the impact of cybersecurity is, it is, all, is, is growing. We see this every you know, year after year. Um, yeah, three years ago, the idea of ransomware was very esoteric. Okay, and you know, last year, and especially amplified by the pandemic, it you know it had hundreds of millions of dollars of impact. Uh, and that's just one. That's just you know one narrow slice. Of cybersecurity, there's so many other examples that we can talk about. So, you know, this is a thing that is, you know, it's worrisome, but we also have. Um, it's also an opportunity for a lot of innovation. We also have a lot of very, very good and smart people dedicated to solving this problem. Um, so, you know, in general, I'm optimistic, but you know, I can be optimistic and worried at the same time. Colleagues, so I can uh, jump in on yeah. that question. I think uh, Ahmed raises uh, some great points and he obviously is right in the middle of all these cybersecurity issues. Uh, that is a huge problem. I mean, there are attacks uh, taking place uh, every day, but uh, kind of stepping back from that issue and just thinking a little more broadly about the geopolitical situation. I mean, I think in the technology area, we basically have a fight between whether technology is gonna be governed by democratic values or authoritarian values. And we see there are lots of opportunities to use technology in very positive ways, use it for the public good, empower people, create more opportunities, uh, and help solve uh, pressing problems. But we also know that technology can and is being used uh, for mass suppression, uh, to keep track of what uh, people are doing uh, to oppress uh, individuals, and that is a huge uh, problem. Uh, so what we uh, suggest, uh, General John Allen and I uh, wrote a column a couple months ago on the Brookings Technology Policy blog called Tech Tank, and, and you can read it at brookings.edu. We suggest that we need global agreements on AI to get into these issues of where we can and should use AI and where we should not be using it. And we give the parallel of the post-World War II era, where you know, we had nuclear weapons were being deployed, uh, people worried about chemical weapons, uh, bio agents, and so on. The countries of the world came together to negotiate agreements, and in some cases, treaties, that basically put limits on the use of that technology. You know, we tried to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. We basically adopted treaties saying nobody would use chemical weapons. And by the way, that treaty has held up pretty well. You know, there have been some, uh, some exceptions to that uh, in Iraq and in Syria, but by and large, uh, the leaders of the world have not used uh, chemical weapons. So fast forward to the current period, we argue that we're at a turning point now where AI and autonomous uh, weapons uh, uh, and other emerging technologies can be used in national defense and in national security. Right now, we don't have any guardrails. In some cases, we're not even talking to our adversaries about how we're thinking about AI and how they're thinking about AI. This is a very dangerous and unstable period in human existence because you can imagine a, a situation where the use of an autonomous weapon in the South China Sea might spark a war, and it could be an inadvertent uh, use. Uh, and so we need to be talking to our adversaries in the same way that in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, America and Europe 
and the Soviet Union talked, even though we had nuclear weapons pointed at, at each other. So today we need to start thinking about where we are willing to use uh, certain technologies, but also where we should not be willing to use them. We need to start incorporating uh, these human guardrails at the global level as well. Right, and uh, just to follow a quick question, do you see that sort of um, uh, opinion formatting around the globe? Do you think we can gather that consensus that automatic weapons would be something we sort of either we have agreement or we agree in itself already how we use? Do you see that or actually the opinions are quite diverse and that might be the same lengthy process? Well, we're having these debates over the use of military drones. So for example, in the United States, we want to keep humans in the loop. Like we will use drones for military reconnaissance, intelligence gathering, kind of tracking particular targets. But before we press the button on actually firing that weapon, there is a human being that is in the loop that actually has to approve that. Like we think that is a policy sh that should be adopted by all countries around the world. It's not clear we're at that uh, situation right now. And that's part of the destabilizing nature of technology. Like if, if other countries are going to deploy fully autonomous weapons and allow them to make decisions to fire on their own, that's destabilizing because there could be errors that are made there. There could be inadvertent decisions that get made. So that's exactly the type of conversation we need to be having with Russia, with China, with Iran, with North Korea, and a number of other countries so that everybody has a common understanding of, of what we're doing, what we're willing to do, and what we think should not be allowed to take place. I agree, and I think it's clear that that's a not a tech technical problem that needs to be solved by technology people. It it is a policy level debate and it does take leadership to agree. And um, I hope that NATO, by the way, again, to remind you, right, the discussion happening here is a NATO strategic communication center. So the alliance, of course, uh, has to gear up its strengths, both in communication, but in all the modern technologies that come, come with it uh, or within the same space. So uh, there is uh, clearly a, a huge field of the work to continue. Uh, we are sort of steering into end of the debate, and, and uh, I was thinking of what would be of this whole many layers, like Amit, you mentioned, you know, that the, this topic obviously has a very many layers, and I think that sometimes uh, these layers are abused when you speak of one thing and then you bring another thing, and uh, they kind of contradict or support wrong uh, arguments and doesn't lead to solutions, but I think we did a bit of systematic way of unwrapping number of topics, to me personally, I was happy to learn that we do have a lot of uh, agreement across the uh, Atlantic. Uh, I think it's a good starting point and then I'm sure it has a lot to do with the new administration coming in and, and starting its work. So we are looking forward to sort of progress in, in that work with, with you, Amit, in, and other colleagues in LEAD. But um, I will ask you sort of a, a, a tour de table or a rounding up question on, on AI particularly, going back to the topic of, you know, future living smart. What's your personal, sort of, so don't we dive into all layers again, what's your kind of personal favorite AI that you are, or anything of those modern technologies that you are either already seeing or looking forward to appear as a great benefit, be it, you know, personally or societal, whichever way. And, and I guess just in a sum up, a big concern, the biggest concern that you face, like the biggest immediate concern, and we spoke about many of them, so need to choose some. <laughs> but I will give a quick tour around you just to say what's your sort of thing you're looking forward in these emerging technologies, really, and what's your biggest concern. And uh, either way, who, who feels ready with, with, a, with a quick answer, uh, I'm happy. I, I can start off, yeah. Uh, actually, my uh, area that I think uh, really impacts a lot of people and impacts me personally is my biggest kind of, uh, you know, win, I would say, for AI, but also something that I would be concerned with if it's not done correctly. And that's the area of uh, NLP, natural uh, language processing, and how it's being used uh, to, to help communicate faster. Because... Really, if we look at how the web has connected the, the world, one of the struggles we actually have uh, is that we're 
connected with far more people than we can can handle. So an area that I've seen it really be beneficial that's incorporated in somebody's Gmail, if they use Gmail, is uh, Smart Compose that it's actually predicting uh, what your likely next statement will be. This is something that, you know, it affects everybody, but it's not something we always think of in terms of under the mantle of AI. It's less, you know, uh, you know, debated as something like autonomous vehicles. Uh, but it does, it does really uh, benefit in terms of time and an efficiency. Uh, I think that's a, a, major, uh, a major benefit of, of how AI can improve our lives. So, so certainly when I think of, of AI and how it can allow me to communicate and even uh, outside of Smart Compose with uh, across different languages, which has always been a struggle on, uh, on these issues. Uh, oftentimes it's communicated in uh, either English or Spanish, but obviously so many people are then being left out. I think there's capabilities to uh, quickly translate uh, language that I'm gonna see uh, huge benefits. But I think to tie that in with a concern that I would have is we wanna make sure that it is still based on your kind of authentic self because a struggle that I see in my kind of personal life, which was I've seen a lot of other individuals is that sometimes kind of alters our free will, right? If we can delegate something to, uh, to kind of a smart compose or, or AI, we wanna make sure that it's still our uh, authentic self, right? We wouldn't wanna have an example where you receive an email from me uh, and I didn't write any of it, but we don't know, do we, do we uh, you know, subscribe it to my AI or do we, uh, you know, subscribe it to, to me? So I think that's gonna be a, a big issue too is, how far do we incorporate these types of tools in allowing us to increase our efficiency of communication and still maintain a sense of authenticity behind the, the individual? So I, can, uh, I can go next. Uh, and actually, uh, I think uh, you know, my favorite AI is very similar to what, what David mentioned. Um, so, you know, I personally uh, suffer from information overload. There's you know, a limitless number of things to read and consume, and uh, you know it's always really, really interesting things. And the world is evolving faster and faster, and it's producing more and more information. Um, and the recent advances in AI to very effectively summarize documents and also present to me the things that I personally would be interested in, uh, I think that's quite breathtaking. And you know, I think very, very convenient. Uh, you know, it's, and it's just getting better and better and better. So on one side, uh, you know, that's, that's a great innovation. Very similar technologies can also be used, uh, you know, for example, the open AI's GPT-3 uh, capability now can synthetically produce a paragraph which is in, essentially indistinguishable from what a human might, might write, okay? And so you can ask it to write something on a topic you know, which has never has existed before and it'll create something where you read it and you say, wow, okay, uh, I can't really tell whether it was a human that wrote it or a machine. And, you know, that has some very interesting implications. And then of course you extend that to, um, you know, what we've all seen with uh, deep fakes in both audio and video. Uh, and so then you, you, you begin to question, okay, if all are essentially a sensory inputs whether it's text or audio and visual, can be synthetically generated in such a way that I cannot tell the difference, then what is reality? Okay, and that whole space is, you know, is, no, no on, the one, on the one hand, it'd be great if I could just do, you know, 10 Zoom calls concurrently and have nine of them be very authentic deep fakes. That would make me incredibly productive. On the other hand, you know, one, that can be amazingly abused, okay? Uh, and then two, you know, I kind of want to know what my deep fake is saying about, you know, really important topics at, uh, at NATO Stratcom. Uh, you know, especially, I, I don't want to get into trouble. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's two sides to the coin, and, you know, and especially that whole area of technology is, uh, it's, it's breathtaking, the advance, advances that have happened, but also quite worrisome on what is possible. 
Thank you, Amita, and I really enjoyed your uh, sort of hum sense of humor. Don't we all dream sometimes that these Zoom conferences could be somehow, <laughs> you know, AI could somehow help us with, with, with delegating this and, and doing instead of us. Uh, yes, uh, um, yours, your comments. There. Uh, well, I agree with uh, David and Ahmed. There are certainly lots of exciting developments on the productivity side. I have to say my favorite AI application actually is in the area of autonomous vehicles, uh, self-driving uh, vehicles. And I have to admit this technology has been slower to develop than what uh, many people thought. It was just a couple of years ago, people were saying by 2020, uh, these vehicles were really gonna be on the road in major uh, cities. Uh, that clearly has not happened. So, uh, you know, we're still working out how to actually operate these in a safe manner. but. The thing to keep in mind and what makes me uh, hopeful about this technology is when this technology is perfected, it is going to be so much safer than human drivers. I mean, I don't know what the situation is in Europe, but in America, we have over 40,000 highway fatalities every year. 90% of them are due to human error, human intoxication, human distraction, or just uh, other uh, types of uh, human uh, mistakes. Autonomous vehicles still are going to be involved in fatalities, and we already have seen several of them take place. But in general, autonomous vehicles are going to be far safer than humans because they're not going to get drunk and they're not going to get distracted. So uh, they're not going to be uh, perfect, but they're going to do a much better job on the road than uh, any of us uh, do. And then a second thing I'll just mention very quickly is the use of data analytics for performance evaluation. I'm just seeing more and more of this, like when I go to my local bank for a financial transaction, almost immediately thereafter, I'm getting a survey asking me to rate the performance of that individual. Did he or she do uh, what I uh, needed? And I think this is going to ultimately produce a revolution in job evaluation and human performance uh, in the sense that it's going to create more accountability. We're going to be able to use data analytics to basically spot the bottom 10% that are doing a terrible job uh, and uh, kind of figure out who actually is uh, doing a good job. So I think that will be transformative as we start to deploy that more and more. Thank you very much. I think this was a great, uh, great roundup. Uh, I'm really grateful for all your contributions. I think we kind of galloped through very many different angles, and it is really, a really huge topic with, with many knowns and unknowns coming. Uh, and I'm, as I said before, I'm really happy to see from my public policy perspective that, that uh, at least transatlantic uh, community uh, is, uh, is coming to common sort of uh, tasks and common understanding so actually we can proceed more efficiently. With that, I say a great thank you to you. I really hope that uh, sooner than later we will be again meeting in person because I think that's, regardless of what AI can do, is still really important for all of us. And uh, thanks again for joining us at this debate.